I'm Shani Petroff, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret White, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Shani Petrov. You can find all of the archives of the show over at hankgarner.com. And when you're there, please click on the links in the right-hand sidebar to subscribe to the show. That way you don't miss an episode. Thank you to all of our sponsors. We're going to be telling you about them throughout the show uh, for making the show possible. If you would like to sponsor the show, go to hankgarner.com and click on the link to advertise. It's up in the top menu bar. We knew it would be bad. There are levels of bad. There was no scale that could have measured this one. Residents listened as 130 mile per hour winds tore away their roofs and struggled to stay alive as water crept into their homes, threatening to drown people in their living rooms. When the winds died and the rain finally stopped, the streets were only navigable by boat. The death toll rose to over 70 and more than 1 million cars flooded with an estimate of $100 billion in destruction. How does a community, a city, a state survive when hit by a monster storm and then have every square inch covered by over four feet of water? A storm which can only be described as a 1,000 year flooding event worse than Hurricane Katrina and broke all historical records. Lived through one man's experience as the world grew more and more uncertain. Experienced through the medium of social media the day-by-day visceral experience of watching people's lives permanently altered and the heart-filling moments when strangers, neighbors, and friends stepped up and helped those in trouble. Watch as needs are met, lives preserved, and hope restored in the two months following Harvey. Get your signed paperback copy of Two Months with Harvey by Terry R. Hill. Go to terryrhill.net. Proceeds from this project are going to benefit people still struggling in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. terryrhill.net. Two months with Harvey. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Shani Petroff with us. She has a brand new book called My New Crush Gave to Me, and it's a, a really awesome book. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Uh, welcome to the show, Shani. Oh, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Excellent. Um, I begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Well, I remember way back when in grade school, when I was really little, we made these little books and we would bind them together and we kind of had this cardboard and maybe duct tape on the end. And I wrote one with a friend that was called Blue Beauty and it was a take on a fairy tale. I think I combined Sleeping Beauty and Snow White and made my own little book and my friend illustrated it. So that was when I always loved the creative creative aspect. So Growing up, I would start writing a little and think someday I'm going to write a book, but then I ended up getting a little sidetracked and more into the acting world, but eventually came back to writing. I love it. Um, So many guests here lately have had this great story of creating books when they were little kids and binding them and and making, uh, you know, more than just writing a story, like making books. Like there's this (laughs) there's this magical thing about the the finished book. And I, I, I made uh, you know, not only a story, but this is this is a book that you can put on your shelf. Like there's something in our minds that, uh, <laughs> that you know, when you put the cover on it and all that, that it's a real yeah, thing. Definitely. I think there's still in my bedroom at my mom's house somewhere. <laughs> oh, how cool. So fun. So fun. Um, where did you grow up? I grew up in Connecticut. Okay. Were you were you a big reader uh, other than, you know, an, an, a budding author at, uh, you know, as oh, a toddler? Yes. Yeah. A huge reader. My father had a book with him at all times, so it kind of got passed down. Like, he was the type that 
if like at a red light, if he would pull out a book and read a page or two, I don't recommend that, but <laughs> he did. like he had them all the time. Like, you know, he, whenever he had free time, it was constantly reading before my brother was born. His whole bedroom was just bookshelves and bookshelves and bookshelves of books. So I grew up just loving reading and always like we would go to the library and I'd come back with the maximum amount they would allow you to take out <laughs> and just, kind of been that way ever since i uh, i had uh, a friend uh, a guy that i knew one time that would take a book with him everywhere like that but he would actually prop the book up on the steering wheel and <gasps> read as he drove and i was no! like you know i said you know they make <laughs> audio books they'll actually read to you and you exactly. can keep your eyes fully on the road you know i was just i was waiting to read the news one day that some tragic you know thing happened because he you know there's a plot twist oh. and he went off the road but Oh man. Um, <laughs> did, did your dad, uh, ever share books with you? You know, we would read a lot. Our tastes were a little different because he was very into like the sci-fi and the things like that, which was not quite my genre. Although right now I do find that every so often I do pick up one and really enjoy it. But at that point, I think, you know, even now I read a lot of YA books and even I still to this day still read a lot. And that really wasn't in his repertoire. But although who knows, like, he has, he's unfortunately passed away years ago, but I bet he'd be reading them now if I'd be like, check it out. <laughs> and you'd definitely be reading mine. <laughs> we know as, as parents, we, um, uh, you know, we, we will, we will endure a lot of things for our kids. Uh, yes. and, and the funny thing is, is when you think you're enduring something, uh, you know, you get wrapped up in the story, you know, sometimes because, because mm -hmm. great storytelling is great storytelling, uh, no matter what the genre is. And, uh, you know, I've, I've found that with my, uh, I, I have a wife and three daughters. We also have two sons, but, oh, uh, nice. the, the three daughters, we, we wind up watching a lot of chick flicks and, and stuff like that. And, <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, I, I like them. So, you know, that's, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's funny that, uh, because good storytelling is just good storytelling. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Um, exactly. so, so at what point did, uh, you know, did you think that this was a serious thing that, that you could pursue, not just, you know, the hobby of, of writing and, and that, but when did you realize that, uh, you know, this is something that you could put some effort into and actually hone your craft? I was freelancing at a TV news station where I would write and segment produce and do things like that. And a lot of the news that was coming in was, you know, it's sad. It's, you know, you have a lot of things that you're like, wow, this is really tough. And you have to report it the way it is because, you know, it's factual. So I was like, I needed an escape. So I decided to take a writing class and I signed up for one that was a YA young adult writing class because I was like that was what I grew up reading and I was like this would be fun so you know get to write something completely different so I took that class and that kind of launched into wow this is something I could really do and it just sort of took off from there so now I actually write the books but I still actually freelance at the news station oh that's so cool um how did you get started uh, at the news station you know what this one is really random. I was pursuing acting and I decided one day that maybe I should be a TV reporter and I picked up the phone and I, oh, actually this is dating myself, but I opened up the phone book and I, the first one I saw was for the station I'm at now. And I called them and I was like, do you have any sort of training program if you want to be a reporter? And they were like, you have amazing timing. Why don't you come in for an interview? So I w couldn't go that day. I was like, well, I can't today. They were like, are you free tomorrow? And I was like, well, if you can have me out by two. So the next thing I know, I was going in and I went in for an interview. And it turned out to be more for writing than for actual reporting. But I started off there as a trainee, which is basically an intern with a college degree and sort of worked my way up and been, been there ever since. How fun. Um, yeah. did, did you did you think, well, you know, I, I like writing, too. This could be a good fit. You know, I did. I, I enjoyed the writing because originally when I was there, I was doing other stuff and I was constantly like, like, I want to write. And they're like, you don't have the experience for it. I'm like, but I can do it. I'm like, give me the writing test. <laughs> so I took the writing test and I did write. They're like, all right, we'll give you a few trial days. And those went well. So they gave me a few more. And now I'm there pretty consistently. So it's nice. That's so funny. Um, you know, a, a, a common thread that runs through the, through the show a lot 
is that uh, a lot of writers have have dabbled in acting or you know have been pretty serious actors yeah. uh, but you know there's this there's this really unique relationship between uh, fiction writers and actors and i've often wondered if um it was so many actors come to writing because of the freedom uh, to to explore characters that they couldn't on stage or on screen and and that you have full control uh, on the page. And maybe, you know, the, a, a bit of a frustrated part because, you know, the it, it's just not quite as fulfilling in some ways as being in complete control. Um, what do you think about that? Well, I think, you know, they definitely have aspects that are similar because you get to learn about a character. You get to like when you're writing it, sometimes, you know, you get in the you know, you feel like you're in the mind of that character as you're writing them. So you get to play all the different roles. So there definitely is a piece of that. I remember for the first book I wrote, which was called The Devil, The Little Angel, it was a middle grade series about a girl who finds out her dad is the devil. So it's a little supernatural there. Um and my first edit notes were from my, my editor was, this reads like a screenplay, too much dialogue. And I was like, you know what it does? It's just like, so she's like, are you writing this so that you will turn into a movie and you can be in it? And I was like, you know what? Maybe. No, but That's hilarious. There's, there's definitely, I feel like a lot of similarities. You do learn about characters, you know, you get into the mindset. So you have to put yourself in both situations. You put yourself in there. The difference is with this one, though, it's almost like the whole thing is you. So you write the words and every, every character. So you have a responsibility of the whole book and not just your one part and like making it as like the ensemble. <laughs> Although writing a book does have its ensemble aspects, too, when you, you work with your editor and critique partners and all of that. You know, that's so funny that uh, that they said there's too much dialogue in here because, you know, one common mistake that that uh, early writers make is there's not enough dialogue. There's too <laughs> much, you know, kind of navel gazing and, you know, there's well, there's way too much description and nobody does anything or says anything. Um, so, you know, that's a good place to start from is, you know, with, with kind of fully <laughs> realized characters. It was fun. And then I had to go back in and add more descriptions. So it was, it was, I mean, I had a big, I mean, I made a lot of changes, but it was, it was definitely fun and a learning experience. And it was, you know, and then that was the first book and there was four of those. So it was fun. I got to live with those characters for, for a while. So, so you're working at the news station and you're, you're cutting your teeth as a writer and learning all about that. Um, how do you, uh, you know, venture to to writing that first piece of fiction that you uh, you know send out into the world and eventually get published. Well, it's interesting. So for the first one <coughs> that I wrote was a completely different book. Um, that the first class that I took. Well, let me backtrack. Was it was like a twelve week class, and it was like finish your book in twelve weeks, and I wrote like three pages and I kept rewriting those three pages for the whole 12 weeks. And I was like, this is not good. And then I decided I wanted to take it again, but I was like, I am only taking it if I will finish it. So between the two classes, I sat down and I just like turned out a whole bunch of pages. And I was like, okay, I can do this. So I went in and I finished the book and then I edited it and I did get an agent from that book, but that book never sold. So while I was taking, but I kept taking the class because I liked the workshop aspect of it. And it, I liked having deadlines. I work really well under pressure and on deadlines. So I kept taking the class and I started another project. And the woman who taught the class used to be an editor and she liked it and passed it on actually to a, a former coworker of hers who contacted me and was like, Hey, can I see more? So it kind of worked out. It was really great. She they had they knew I knew how to finish a project because of that other book I wrote that never sold, but that I worked well under deadlines. I knew how to make changes and edits. So I actually sold my first book with a couple of chapters and a really, really detailed proposal. Oh, wow. Um, and and what was that first book? That was Bedeviled Daddy's Little Angel. Gotcha. Um, who was the intended audience for that book? What, what for that age one, group? that one was middle grade. So I would say like third grade to like eighth grade for that one. The ones I'm writing now, like um, Romeo and what's her name? My new crush gave to me airports, X's and other things I'm over are more are, are YA and 
Romeo, I do have some younger readers and, and even Mind of the Crush too, but it definitely goes all the way through high school. So it's, it's definitely older than Bedeviled. Right. Um, was that a, a conscious effort when you started writing Bedeviled that, that you were targeting that age group or was that just kind of who the characters were? You know, it kind of fell in the middle, enough so that it was strapping both. And when the edit notes came in, I had to either we had to decide whether to up it so that it was a little older or make it a little younger because it was straddling with both because, you know, when it's a girl whose dad is the devil. So when you have hell in there, how are you how light are you going to make it or how and I kind of when middle and then we decided to go younger so really it's really actually even though it, it is a girl who finds out her dad is the devil it's actually really light and comical and nobody dies and you don't worry that anybody will it's very you know so we decided to go the younger route you, you know i think that's a a conundrum that a lot of writers find themselves in when when you start uh writing to a a particular age group uh, audience because we do have these um these categories of, of middle grade and YA and, and they really can be very confusing for a lot of people. You know, is this, yeah. is this age appropriate for this? Is this, uh, you know, are, are there some certain hard guidelines, uh, that, that when you're in the industry and you're, you're publishing and, uh, and, and, you know, working on these books are, are, are there really some, some hard guidelines or is it still just kind of murky and it kind of constantly changes? I think it probably depends on the book. Like my book in general was kind of light in, in comical. So I feel like they decided instead of making it older because the girl I had, she got powers when she hit 13. So the age was kind of still, she started off as 12, still kind of made it more middle grade. Not always, but a lot of times people tend to read up. So if someone is at the characters 12 or 13, you don't have as many 17 year olds picking it up. Right. So if that's the main character, it was more it, either I was going to have to change the age a little bit or and make a different like point of why she got the powers or make it a little younger and then ha know that I'd have the readers. And it's not not across the board. There are definitely older readers who read younger characters. But in general, people at that age do seems tend to read a little older. Right. Right. So how long did it take you to write uh, Daddy's Little Angel? You know, that one, I didn't have that long for the first draft, so it was probably a month or two to bang out a first draft. Gotcha. Um, a, a lot of times when, when you're writing, uh, especially early on in your writing career, you, you tend to kind of channel uh, authors that, that you liked as, as a youngster, or at least, um, I, I don't want to use the word imitate because that's not a that's not the word, but uh, right. sort of emulate a style or something like that as you find yours. Uh, was there a, a particular book series or uh, an author that you were kind of thinking about when you envisioned the series that helped you kind of get into that zone? Not necessarily, but I, growing up, loved like just fun like fun reads that you didn't have to always think so hard, but like, you know, Sweet Valley High and the babysitter clubs, just like, you know, almost like candy. Like I just kept eating, like I had, I would go to, I remember going to the bookstore and I'd pick up one Sweet Valley High and I'd read it on the car ride back and be done with it. And then be like, we need to go get the next one. <laughs> and, you know, so I, I just, I wanted something that also reluctant readers would enjoy and, you know, just something fun. So that like a little bit of escape where you can just read it and have a laugh and a smile on your face type of thing. Yeah. Uh, you, you wound up writing four books in that series, right? Yes. Um, how, uh, a, as you were progressing through, uh, through writing those, uh, you know, did the, did the subsequent books get easier as you kind of had your characters established? Can, what was the, the growth process for you as a writer in working on that series? You know, it was mixed. I mean, there were some nice aspects of like, you know, who your characters are, you know, the settings you even know, because it was all within the same school year, you knew the order of classes, like little things that you knew, didn't have to think about, because they've already been thought about like, oh, math was this period and lunch comes at this time. And this is in who's in her homeroom class. And this is the teacher. And this is what the building looks like, like things like that were taken care of. So I had already established that. So I just had to stick with that um that being said also rules that i had established i had to 
keep. So if I said she doesn't do this, then I had to remember, well, I can't audit, I can't now go, oh, well, the rules of magic have changed. Like whatever I set up in book one, it has to hold through the series. So there are some ways that it was easier. Like book two came to me super easily. Like I wrote it right away. There wasn't a ton of edits and it was really easy. Book three, I struggled with and I ended up after handing in the first draft, I spoke with my editor and we were like, we're like, something is just missing. And we came up with a twist and I was like, that's it. That's exactly what's missing. The unfortunate part was that I knew that that had to happen in like the second chapter of the book. So I basically had to rewrite the whole thing, (laughs) but it was okay. I was, I was really, once I figured that out, I was so much happier and I was really happy with how it turned out. But it was like, when you realize that that change happened so early, it changed everything. Everything, <laughs> but it's it's an easier pill to swallow when uh, when you get that realization that oh this is going to be the thing that makes the story yes. really. I was work. like that's what was missing, like that was the conflict, like that's perfect. I know what it is, but yeah, <laughs> I would have preferred coming up with it before I had done the draft. But you know, it was learning, and it probably made it a stronger book. So yeah. yeah. Um, what are some of the challenges when writing uh, toward a younger audience? Uh, because, uh, you know, um, YA and up, uh, those readers typically buy books for themselves or at least right. have a, a lot of influence on the buyer. Some you know, younger YA readers, uh, maybe they don't buy the books themselves, but they, you know, they're able to communicate with their parents and think that this is something I really love and, and want. Uh, and then, of course, there's there's tons of adults that read YA, um, right. you know, and, and those people are making buying decisions for themselves when you're when you're dealing with the younger middle grade, um, it, it's harder to to get directly to that audience. You're going through teachers or parents or, or things like that. So what are some of the challenges as the writer uh, to make sure that you're communicating with your intended audience? And uh, and because all authors have to be business people now in the, in the right. climate that we're in, uh, you know, how do you kind of fashion some of your marketing efforts and things like that to make sure that you're connecting? Well, in that one, I just tried to write the best book I could, and that would be enjoyable. Back then, I mean, this one came out, gosh, it might have been, what, nine years ago, the first one? I, uh, Yeah, 2000, uh, 2000, 2009, I think, was um, when the first Bedeviled came back. So social media wasn't the same as it is right now, like where everyone was on Instagram. I don't even think Instagram was there back then. So it wasn't as intense but I did still try to do some things I would try to do a lot of signings at at back then I did a lot of borders because they were right in the mall so I could get traffic as people were walking through (laughs) and be like hey look check it out but for the most part I just really hoped for you know that the book would people would read it and like it and maybe spread the word and trusting the publishing house to like help get the word out. But yeah, it is a little harder. You don't have as direct contact with now, with now, like, you know, with my new crush gave to me and Romeo and what's her name. You do have a lot more interaction with readers and with people who might be interested in the book as compared to with that younger audience. You're not necessarily doing that as much. I did try to do some school visits and libraries and tried to do groups like that to talk to people, but it it is, it is a different different challenge. Yeah. Um, so after the fourth book, uh, you kind of shifted gears and, and started writing uh, with new characters in a, in a whole different direction. Uh, what was that, uh, decision process like to, to lead Bedeviled and, and, uh, and, and go for a more mature audience? You know, I was going to do another, and I still, um, have plans to do middle grade and chapter books again. Cause I do, I think, it's such a great genre and I love them and I've loved those books growing up and I love them now. So it is definitely something I'm thinking about, but with Romeo and what's her name, there is this part of Macmillan has one of the imprints is called swoon reads and they have this really awesome thing where you as a writer can upload your book and then readers on the site can read it and critique it. And then the editorial board there looks at those comments. They look at the books, they read the books, and then they pick, it can be anywhere from like one to five per season. 
that they publish. And I just thought it sounded so cool, like such a great way to interact with people who love books and are reading. And, you know, so I did, I uploaded, um, Romeo and what's her name to the site. And I thought it would just be a fun thing to do. It was, I had started it as a short story years ago. And I always thought I wanted to do more with it. I was like, one day I want this to be a book. And at the time swoon reads was romance only. Now they're open to all genres of young adult books. But at the time it was romance. And I was like, Oh, this might be the perfect book for them. I'm like, I was always looking for a reason to write this. And now I'm like, now I think I may have it. And I had finally come up with the ending that I wanted because I wanted the short story to kind of be near the beginning of the book and then to go from there. But I hadn't known how I wanted to end it. And then when the ending came to me, I was like, this is it. I have it. And I wrote out a draft and like fixed it up and then was able to make it in time for one of the deadlines. And I was lucky enough to be selected that season. And it's been a great relationship ever since I had that one came out with them. My new um, crush gave to me just came out on Halloween. I have airports, X's and other things. Um, over is coming out in May. And I just signed on with them for two more books. Um, one called finding Mr. Better than you that will come out the following year. So it's been a really fun ride so far. How cool. Um, in, in writing uh, Romeo and what's her name, uh, what were what were some of the challenges in in writing to that audience or, or were there challenges at all? Did it just feel natural? Um, it, what's uh, what was kind of your uh, your creative process in approaching that? see you know I mean there's always challenges in everything, but I think for this one, I mean one of the big things for me was figuring out how I wanted to end it because I did have this like massive scene that I thought was kind of a huge point, which I had ended the short story with. And I was like, Hmm, I kind of want to maybe want to end the book with that. And I was like, well, maybe I can top it. So when coming up with that was what also put that book on hold for me for a while. Cause I didn't, couldn't figure out what I wanted that to be. And when I finally realized it, I felt like such a weight off of my shoulders. And I was like, okay, this is how I want to end this book. And then I was able to just sit down. I sat down one night and I was, I went to a restaurant to like, cause sometimes I need to get out of my house to think. And I just sat down, pulled down notebook and outlined the whole thing. And for that first draft, it actually kind of stuck to that outline. Of course, after, you know, the editorial letter and all of that, it changed a bunch. But for that draft, it really was kind of consistent with the outline. I just sat down and was like, I know what this book is. And I wrote the whole thing out. And for that first draft, that was pretty much it. Um, do you normally outline like that? You know, what? it varies uh, for... Romeo I did for airports, X's and other things I'm over. I did for my new crush gave to me. I had a really hard time sitting down and writing out an outline because I really, I saw the book in my head. I like almost as if it was a movie and I knew what I wanted to happen and when and sitting it down to actually write them out into individual, like this happens in this chapter and this happens. It seemed like extra work almost and I and tedious because I'm like I can see it I don't need to write out these notes I know what I'm doing so instead for that one because it takes place within just within a few weeks basically like after I think they get back after um, Thanksgiving and it goes through Christmas and then there's like an extra chapter at the end that takes place in New Year's but that's kind of like a bonus chapter so basically through um, the day after Christmas, I pulled out a calendar and made sure I had everything where it needed to be. So I was like, oh, because it is about, you know, a girl who rigs a secret Santa to win over the guy of her dreams. So there's a lot of gift giving in in there. So I was like, well, I have to make sure I have everything on the right day. So I was like, she gives this gift on this day. She gets this gift on this day. The football game is that day. The secret Santa exchange is on this day. The party is on this day. Like I, I made sure everything was on the calendar so that when I wrote, I made sure that like oh yes this happens in the right order like she has the you know the Christmas morning with her mom like everything was there but that was pretty much the only outlining I did was jotting down when things happened on a calendar for that particular one then I just wrote it 
Gotcha. Um, do you do any special planning uh, for your characters uh, before you start writing? Do you, you know some people will will actually make whole biographies for for characters. Uh, some people will will kind of cast a book um, so that when you start writing, you kind of uh, you know have a, a look and feel for characters. Or do they just kind of come organically and just kind of reveal themselves to you as you're writing? I. It's a combo, I guess, of like of them coming organically, but and then thinking them through. Like a lot of nights, especially when I'm procrastinating, I'll just like lie in bed and I'll think about a character and think about a chapter and really let it kind of develop so that I can almost see it. It's a lot easier for me to write, and I do it a lot faster if I can picture it. So if I can like almost see the scene playing out in my head, then I can get it on paper. If I'm having a hard time envisioning it in my mind I have a harder time getting it out on paper so I really do need to to visualize it and see it and see the characters as people and their surroundings and what they're doing and you know and then it's easier for it to like come to life to me for me to actually get it on the page Nick Breaker's book Essence Book One Septima, one of the best science fiction writers I know. Nick Breaker weaves some of the best science fiction adventure stories you'll ever read. Essence, Book One Septima is a must read. Go pick it up today. There's a link to it in the show notes. Third Scribe is the place for authors and readers to meet. Go to thirdscribe.com. You can set up an account for free and you can link up with some of your favorite authors and find out what's going on with them. Authors, you need to have a place where you can highlight your books to your audience. Thirdscribe.com is built especially around books, linking people that love books with people that write books. Go visit them today. Thirdscribe.com. Tell Robin the folks that I sent you. Tales from the Canyons of the Damned, episode 20, just dropped today. It is amazing. With stories by Jess West, Rhett Bruno, Eamon Ambrose, Bob Williams, Tales is my favorite monthly publication. Go pick it up today and get that old pulp goodness feeling. Tales from the Canyons of the Damned, episode number 20, out right now. Chronicle World's Tales of Dystopia, 13 stories of animals and humans interacting at the end of the world. Uh, This project also benefits Pets for Vets, one of uh, the most outstanding charities out there, linking up rescue animals with veterans that need some companionship. So go pick up a copy of Chronicle World's Tales of Dystopia. It's only 99 cents while it launches. At the end of the show, don't forget we have an audio book clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. You know the um, the the YA and uh, especially kind of teen years are uh, are really tricky in that things change uh, so so quickly and so often. Um, how do you, as a writer who's who's writing these books, uh, stay current uh, so that uh, you don't sound like you know the grown up trying to write a story for me? <laughs> well, you know, you know, try I try to stay as up to date as I can, but I also try not to put in anything that will date the book either like a reference to a tv show or you know one of my originally for romeo and what's her name we had mentioned facebook and we decided to take it out just not even though facebook will be around for a while like not as many kids are using it and even and who knows so we made we decided my editor and i decided to make it a fake page so that they were like that way it could be your instagram your twitter your snapchat you're this all in one little thing that you just made up and that way for them for across the board when i have now for all of these like for the three books that are already written whenever i use a social media thing i use it as the fake one that i created that is brilliant. Um, and, and there's nothing worse than reading like a 10 year old book and where the, uh, where the writer was trying to predict, uh, where things would be or, or right. uh, what's worse is, is when a writer tries to, to create slang, uh, that, that they think will be, uh, you know, popular and it just comes off like, Oh, this is, this is gross. This is, <laughs> this is really right. weird, you know? So I like that. I like that you just created a new thing. Didn't put any, um, you know, didn't put the, the importance of it being Facebook or, or whatever and just let it be its own thing. That's great. Right. Cause you also look back, like I didn't for, I didn't do that perfectly for Bedeviled. I have a reference. I think the girls were excited over like Justin Bieber, which yes, there still are plenty of people who are, but not as many 
like eight year olds or 10 year olds as you know, back in the day. So because this was 2009. So or it might have even been a few years after I think I, I don't think I referenced it to like book four or whatever. But it was, you know, they're like, oh, he was just so I do now the same thing if I have like a singer in there, unless they're referencing like and my new crush gave to me like one of the guys, he has this weird fascination with the eighties. Therefore I can mention it because it's his thing and the eighties are still the eighties. But if it's someone like who's the most popular person now, I try to make up a fake person. So I've had had a singer, I think, that came up in my new crush gave to me that fake one that I created. And now for airports, X's and other things I'm over, I used him in that book too. So that it was this fake, you know, singer who didn't have to worry about if he was going to really be popular or not, or <laughs> and it was just kind of what would, it would hold. Yeah. I, I would think it'd be a lot easier to reference like David Bowie, uh, than, than whoever's hot at the moment. Exactly. Pop, pop culture references can be so tricky. So true. Exactly. Or like, or whoever the big YouTube star is right now right. or whoever, you know, and things change and your audience grows and some, you know, the younger ones, they have a new person they like versus a different age group might have somebody else that they're impressed by. Well, and, and the way that our, our media culture is going right now uh, where we've seen uh, actors and, and people that are very respected have fallen from grace pretty True. spectacularly. And uh, yeah, that those could be dangerous, uh, dangerous things. If, if that becomes a cornerstone of your story. True. Yeah. Um, so, so Tim, the new book that's, that's uh, brand new and out and it's called my new crush gave to me. We've mentioned it a couple of times. Uh, yes. Where, where did the idea for this story come from? Well, it was funny. After I wrote Romeo and What's Her Name, I was I had I was contracted for a second book with Macmillan and Swoon. And I had mentioned in the past I knew my editor was really, really wanted a Christmas book. And I had just mentioned in passing, I was like, Oh, I can do that. And I kind of forgot about it. And so then all of a sudden when Romeo was done they were like okay so let's talk about your next book the Christmas one I was like what <laughs> they're like you're writing a Christmas I was like okay cool <laughs> and so <laughs> it was like and then I come up with ideas really fast the harder part is for me is sitting down and actually writing them out but every day I like have a million new ideas that I'd love to write so when I thought Christmas book I was like I know what I want to write <laughs> and um I wanted I played it off of a secret Santa exchange and that kind of stemmed and that portion of it anyway, I was on right after college, I went on a theater tour. It was a children's theater tour and I was one of the performers and we went from city to city and I think we went every state east of the Mississippi, but it was long and we were doing a lot of driving and a lot of traveling and the holidays were coming up and I was like we need to have a secret Santa <laughs> so they were like what and I was like come on so they humored me and we had this huge secret Santa exchange and it's funny I have one of the characters in there who is super excited about having this secret Santa and that one I'm like that not that she's she's definitely not me but that little moment of like the best friend in the book I'm like that was my like we need to do this moment so from there deciding I wanted to have the secret Santa thing then I played off of that where basically this girl thinks she, there's this big party coming up and she wants a date for it and she thinks that she can win over this amazing guy by getting him the perfect gifts for Christmas. But as she goes shopping, she realizes she really has no idea what to get him. So she enlists the help of his cousin who infuriates her and then along the way starts to realize, hmm, who do I like after all? <laughs> so it ends up being just a fun Christmas holiday novel. Um, so I, I got a couple of copies of this book uh, from your publisher. We're going to, we're mm -hmm. going to do a giveaway as a matter okay. of fact. And um, if, if folks will comment in the show notes of this show, uh, we're going to enter you into a drawing for a couple of these. So, so we've got a couple of copies around the house and I was reading one and I gave a couple of copies to my daughters and we all uh, started reading through it and comparing notes. And one <laughs> thing that all of us came back with was just how funny this book is. Oh, thank um, you. And, and one of the things that I think in, you know, being a, a middle-aged, you know, man who's bald and has a beard, uh, <laughs> who's, who's not exactly, you know, maybe your intended audience, uh, but I do read a lot for the, for the show and, you know, just right. to connect with them. Um, 
is that uh, there's a lot of humor that is sorely missing uh, in in this age group and this this kind of genre. Um, was that something you you consciously did, or does this just come out of you naturally? Um, you know, what were your what are your thoughts on keeping it lighthearted and and witty? That, that was definitely like when I was writing these. In my mind, it was definitely going for romantic comedy. So I wanted something light. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now. I just wanted to be able to have like a couple hour escape where you can read the book, laugh, have a, you know, happily ever after you don't worry. This is not a book where you, at the end, you're like, Oh no, they're going to be miserable and everybody's going to be sad, which there are definitely places for those books. And I love some books that are written that way, but for my intent and purpose for this was romantic comedy, happily ever after (laughs) so that people could laugh and, smile and especially with this one around the holidays hopefully get the sense of the holidays in there and you know start looking forward to them and get excited by them and things like that um you, uh, dystopia really tends to kind of dominate uh ya is in an older way uh, over the last few years and uh and, and we we love those stories their hunger yes. games and all of those absolutely Read all of them yes <laughs> yeah as we all have uh, but they're there is just uh, there's there's a hole in the market for for what you describe as lighthearted, happily ever after, because uh, you know you can only stay uh, in the uh, in the tragedy of the world for so long until you, you need a little hope again. And uh, I w- we all love this book for that. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely think there's a place for every type of book. And for this one, though, I just decided, I'm like, yes, I definitely just want something light and fun. And not that I haven't written or won't write or haven't written. I did write a dystopian with someone else that came out a few years ago like that. And I definitely enjoy that genre, too. But for this one, I just definitely I was like, yeah, I just want something that focuses on friendship and, you know, family and friends and just you know, the holidays, something nice yeah. and light. Yeah. Um, what, what are some of the, um, uh, some of the challenges for writing a, a holiday themed book? So, um, are you, uh, do you approach it differently at all? Is it just, you know, part of the backdrop of the story? Do, does, does the, that particular theme play more heavily into the story than, uh, you know, writing, uh, something that's not tied to a holiday? Well, with this one, because it really kind of focused on like one of the main events was that secret Santa. This one, it did play more. It wasn't just the backdrop because I know you can also have a book where it just happens to be holiday time. So for this one, I actually tried to incorporate it. So a lot of the things they do revolve around it. Like they have the two main, like the main character and her best friend have a like a little bakery business but because it was this time of year it's you know christmas and hanukkah cookies that they were making for various events and you know they went caroling and they had an ugly sweater party and you know different things that only happen this time of year tree decorating so the christmas really did influence the book there was a hanukkah party like that whole time of year you know definitely played into it more so than you know with my with like Romeo took place in February and there were you know things that happened around that time of year too but it didn't play as big of a part as like this was like centered on the Christmas events it wasn't just like oh school's in session let's deal with the problems going on here I really I did focus on the Christmas aspects of things gotcha um, you've mentioned uh, that you're working on a new book, uh, airports, uh, exes and other things that I'm over. Uh, what was your, uh, and, and that book comes out uh, in the spring of this year, I think, uh, what were, uh, what was your progression into writing that book? You know, I was, I, again, I wanted something, you know, a romantic comedy and I was trying to think of something and I got, st- and this one, a girl gets stuck at the airport with her ex-boyfriend and they have to make it back in a storm from Florida to New York because she's a singer also. She's a high school singer, but she's also trying, she finally got her big break where she's going to get to perform, but she doesn't know she'll make it back to the city in time. So she has to get back and, part of her only way back is to travel with him. So when I was coming up with that one, I actually got stuck in an airport in Florida because of the storm. And that's when that idea started 
percolating because I was like, I was sitting there for hours. I'm like, oh my God, I'm never getting home. And while I was sitting there, I thought I saw somebody I knew, like an ex-boyfriend coming my way. It wasn't, but I was like, wow, that would be a really fun story. Like being stuck with nowhere to go. And the only person you know is this ex of yours and then having to travel with them and being stuck the whole way. And so while I was there, that idea started, I started like writing it down. I had my phone out and I was just taking little notes and like writing there going, okay, this will happen. This will happen. And, and I kind of put it in my back pocket. And then when it came time to pitch the next book, that was the one that I decided to go with. Gotcha. Uh, what is auras are us? Uh, in the devil, the, the mother is very into new age things. And she had a little business called Auras Are Us. So I decided to just put that on my website as well, which hasn't been updated in a really long time, that page. <laughs> but, but it was basically, I had a few little games on there and like links to the book and things like that. So cool. So cool. Um, Shawnee, you're doing uh, amazing work. Uh, we love what you're doing. The, you, you are a fresh voice in yeah. uh in this uh this genre and this uh this this target uh market i i hope you much success uh Thank with you so the, much. we know the the new book is coming out in the spring right now you can pick up my new crush gave to me this this excellent uh christmas uh romantic comedy uh what's coming next for you uh are are you working on a new project uh i already? am so well first i also did the audiobook for my new crush i gave to me and i will I'll be doing the audiobooks for actually um, Romeo and What's Her Name as well, and Airports X's and other things I'm over. And so you're, you're performing them? <laughs> I am. So that's been a lot of fun. <laughs> so I love I, it when authors perform their own books. Yeah, it, it was it was a great experience. I loved it. So I'm excited that I get to do the next ones. So setting that up, that's coming up pretty soon. And I am currently working on another young adult um contemporary called finding Mr. Better than you about a girl who gets um, dumped right before senior year and her quest to find somebody even better. And it's really though, even though that sounds like that's what it's mainly about, it's really a book about friendship and finding who you are and like, you know, your support system and things like that. But it's also going to be funny and light and friendship and comedy. So I love it. I love it. Um, Shawnee, I'm, I'm, I've become a huge fan. I love what Thank you're doing you so and I hope you, uh, I hope you keep at it. Um, where can people find you if they're not familiar with, familiar with your work and, and want to connect with you? Well, all sorts of different places. Um, I have my website, which is shawneepetroff.com on Twitter. It's just at Shawnee Petroff on Instagram. It's Shawnee period Petroff. And I have a Facebook page as well, which is Shawnee Petroff author. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you for having me. This is a lot of fun. Thanks for listening to the author stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there. I know you'll love now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Summer waned. The sun still kissed the waters of the Hudson, but less passionately, like a bride having second thoughts. The days grew a minute shorter, the shadows a millimeter longer, and fear descended upon Sleepy Hollow just as imperceptibly. Even in the heat of July, when the town still wore shorts and sandals, when it still carried ice chests and pressed beers to its forehead, when its children played in sand piles, and its old men sat talking baseball. Bad things began to happen. Everywhere, it seemed. On the afternoon of July 10th, two Terrytown women went shopping at the barn's stationery store. Both reached for the last package of lace wedding invitations at the same time. Their confrontation ended with bloody fists and an ambulance ride. On July 14th, Larry Putnam choked on a California spring roll at Andy Ng's Japanese sushi restaurant on Beekman Avenue. The following Saturday, Judy Jessup found Gypsy, her daughter's black cat, dead, strung up on the fence behind their house, just dangling there, eyes open and fangs bared. Come sunset, 
Fireflies hung thick above the lawns of the hollow. Red eyes peered through the shutters of abandoned houses. A mist rose from the parched earth and hung low, especially behind the old Dutch church, among the graves of the ancient burying ground. The old Croton Aqueduct Trail, usually a summer playground, grew eerily empty. Hardly anyone walked there, especially at night, when gnarled branches held hands and rustled to each other around cauldron clearings of moonlight. Those who did so reported strange attacks, gossamer apparitions, and the distant sound of horses' hooves. Eleven years prior, after the GM plant had closed, when the village of North Terrytown had been rechristened Sleepy Hollow, it had seemed natural to adopt the horseman as town mascot. He appeared on the badges of the police officers, on the sides of the fire trucks, on the menus of restaurants, on the stationery of the mayor. He arose from his grave as a tchotchke in the gift shops. He haunted the helmets of the football team, the windows of the bike shop, the rings presented to outgoing seniors. The black-cloaked figure of the headless horseman manifested everywhere, ubiquitous as Mickey Mouse in the Magic Kingdom, and almost as subliminal. People had grown used to the horseman, fond of him even. Eventually they had ceased to notice him. They noticed him now. And they noticed him everywhere. On hats and collar pins and park signs, on cars and buses, on statues, on plaques, on the side of the chevron. The horseman galloped down Beekman Avenue, shop window by shop window. He rode in daylight and in darkness and in the nightmares of their children. Their fondness for the figure became fear, dread, and doubt. Why had they named their town after a ghost story? To name a thing is to give it power, to give it substance and flesh. What had they done? Each sunset, as the village of Sleepy Hollow sank deeper into shadow, more and more former North Terrytowners wondered if embracing the legend hadn't been a mistake. But they had to press forward. The mill wheel turns. Summer ends. Time comes for school to start. The ball glove goes into the closet. Grandfather asks for a jacket. Beer becomes coffee or pumpkin spice. A leaf turns, falls, and twists. The season comes. There's money to be made. Time to unpack the fright masks, to fetch the scarecrow from his firehouse closet. Time to bundle the corn stalks and light the pumpkins. Time for the headless horseman to menace the tourists again.